So before I begin, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Bhimu Patel for inviting me here and giving this opportunity to present before you all. And I would like to thank all of you for taking the time and uh, being here to listen to my seminar. Uh, coming to an overview of my talk, I will be basically focusing on produce safety today. And uh, there are two aspects that we focus in my lab. One is pre-harvest produce safety, and the other one is uh, post-harvest uh, produce safety. So what I'm uh, going to do is I'm going to give you some sample projects under each of these uh, categories. And uh, I will be talking to you about attachment of bacteria as well as possibility of internalization into leafy green tissue when the contamination can occur via two routes of exposure. Then I'll also talk to you about attachment and the possibility of cross-contamination from harvesting e equipment, specifically coring tools that are used in lettuce uh, harvesting. And I'll, I'll talk to you about what a coring tool for you know, those of you that don't know about it. Um, then uh, we looked at uh, the safety of uh, organic compost as well as compost amended soils and their application in field conditions, which ones would be better to apply in the field. So we have done some lab studies to look at the survival of pathogenic bacteria on those, so I'll be talking about those as well. And then um, in, uh, in Arizona conditions, specifically in the arid and semi-arid uh, desert region, there are a lot of dust storms. So uh, we have heard from uh, our produce growers that they are getting positive hits for salmonella, especially after they have a, you know, a, a dust storm and right before a rainfall event. So we have looked at what is the possibility of salmonella being disseminated via dust. So I'll be uh, giving you a few uh, sample results from the work we have done on that aspect. And then uh, we have done a project in collaboration with uh, Dr. Patil on uh, cantaloupe safety. We have looked at the prevalence of foodborne pathogenic bacteria naturally on uh, cantaloupe, specifically lines that were uh, developed here by, uh, were developed by Dr. Crosby and Dr. Patil in here, and I'll talk about that as well. And then we'll move on to post-harvest produce safety. And one major focus in our lab is looking at natural ways of decontaminating the uh, fresh produce. So I'll talk about plant uh, antimicrobials as well as organic sanitizers. Um, and then finally, I'll talk to you about a unique way we have of incorporating these antimicrobials in the form of edible films, which can be added as ingredients into salad bags, and they can help kill the bacteria in salad bags. So these are the various projects I'll uh, talk to you about today. And the image that you see in here is uh, contamination on the cantaloupe rind. And uh, we used a bioluminescent salmonella containing the Lux gene. And this was uh, imaged using an EMCCD camera, and you can see uh, bacterial contamination right there. Uh, this slide basically shows what are the various uh, factors that can play a role in the field level in contaminating uh, uh, fresh produce crops. And you can see everything from contaminated seed to contaminated irrigation water. Those are big sources. And we have looked at uh, those in our lab as uh, sources. And then um, uh, compost. Many of the growers in field conditions, what they do is they make their own compost. They have a compost pile in the vicinity of the field. And and let's say the process was not uh, appropriate or not enough to inactivate the pathogens, then uh, dust storms, they can carry these you know, pathogens in the aerosols, and they can contaminate the cross field. So we, we have, that's why we have looked at the safety of compost. And uh, we also, um, uh, insect vectors, you know, they can carry uh, uh, pathogens as well. And then some of the other forms of microbial life, such as nematodes, protozoans, and fungal type of organisms can also act as vectors. And then another one is uh, animal as well as human fecal uh, material. When we go to Yuma, and by the way, Yuma is uh, a big uh, fresh produce growing region. And 98% of the winter supply of produce comes from Yuma. So I talk to the Yuma growers quite often. We visit Yuma and we find out you know, what are their research needs. And uh, for the last uh, two or three years, when I ask them what is your uh, biggest safety concern, they tell me animal intrusion. It's a big problem in Yuma. 
what happens is, I mean, they have these acres and acres of land, and uh, at night, uh, wild animals such as coyotes in the desert, coyotes, javelinas, and deer is a big problem in the California border as well as in California, and so on. So they tell us we are having a lot of problem with animal intrusion, and what happens is these animals, they come into the fields, and they defecate, and then you have the fecal material, and uh, they can carry pathogenic bacteria. Because all these E. coli, salmonella, listeria, monocytogenes, all these are enteric pathogens that can be uh, excreted in the fecal material. And and if, let's say, there's an uh, event where you have uh, animals going into your field conditions and there's fecal material, there's a high chance of cross-contamination onto your crop. So we have done some research on animal feces as well as to how long the various pathogens can survive in animal feces, but I won't be presenting that result today. So uh, the, the reason I'm showing you this slide is in my lab, we focus on many of these infield factors that can contribute to cross-contamination. And it's a very, you know, very nice slide uh, from Brandel's paper in 2006. So now moving on to the research. Uh, the first project I'm going to talk to you about is internalization of salmonella um, in spinach. And you know, when it comes to food safety, internalization is a very controversial subject. And you know, some scientists believe internalization does occur, some believe it, do, it does not occur. Uh, so we wanted to see uh, when we uh, expose the bacteria, we have two routes of exposure. One is contaminated seed, and the other one is contaminated irrigation water that is used for germinating these seeds into sprout. Is there, is, is there really internalization, and is there any difference between the two routes of exposure? And for this study, we used three different types of uh, salmonella isolates. And uh, one is salmonella Newport SN78, which is resistant to two antibiotics, ampicillin as well as streptomycin. And we wanted to use an antibiotic antibiotic resistant isolate because it will be, be easier to isolate these in the presence of uh, uh, background microflora. And then we also used uh, bioluminescent salmonella SN78 containing the Lux gene, which is also antibiotic resistant. And we wanted to use this because we wanted to do some bioluminescent imaging. And this one shows the DAB, or the dual antibiotic resistant salmonella. And uh, this image shows the bioluminescent salmonella Newport SN78 containing the Lux gene. And then the third salmonella we used was the one that contains the green fluorescent protein, as you can see in here. And we used this because we wanted to do some confocal imaging to look at the surface as well as subsurface contaminating salmonella on the spinach tissue as well. And we used four organic uh, spinach cultivars, the Emilia, Lazio, Space, as well as uh, Waitiki. And coming to the methods, as I told you before, we used two routes of exposure. So in the first methodology, what we did is we had spinach seeds, and we contaminated or inoculated these spinach seeds with one of the salmonella isolates, and we let the bacteria attach for about two hours. And then what we did was we uh, uh, dried them overnight uh, in, an, in a, a desiccation chamber. And then uh, after uh, overnight incubation, then we put them into seed pouches. And seed pouches are basically used for germination. So we put them in the seed pouches, and then we used clean sterile water for germinating these. And in about five days, these germinated. And after five days, we put them into pots containing clean soil, which was free of salmonella again. And uh, we let them grow up to the four leaf stage, which is about four weeks. And uh, after the four leaf stage was uh, attained, then we sampled the various plant parts. Using a sterile scalpel, we uh, cut the root, the stem, and the leaf separately, and uh, we sampled them for salmonella. We put them, you know, we macerated the tissue using a sterile pestle and mortar, and then these were diluted, and then they were plated on selective media for salmonella. And then we also sampled uh, the soil that these plants were grown into. And also we flooded, we added about 25 mils of water into each pot. And uh, there was a lot of flooding. And so we took the water, uh, the runoff water, and we sampled that as well for the presence of salmonella. And in the second route of exposure, we use contaminated water. So here we began with clean seeds. And uh, we inoculated the seeds with salmonella. And then what we did was we um, put them into germination pouches. And uh, in the pouch for irrigation, we added the contaminated water. 
And I'm sorry, we did not inoculate the seed with salmonella. We just, we used the seeds, but the water was contaminated with the salmonella. And we let it germinate for about five days. After five days, the same sort of uh, procedure where we grew them up to four leaf stage, and then we sampled them for enumeration of salmonella. And then what we did was we uh, uh, surface sterilized uh, using uh, bleach as well as ethanol, and then we looked um, looked also at the internalization. For internalization, what we did was when we plated them directly after surface sterilization, we did not see anything in our preliminary experiments. So we enriched them using uh, an enrichment uh, buffer. Then we selectively enriched, and then we uh, tried to do the enumeration to see if there was any internalized salmonella. And uh, what you're seeing here is a bioluminescent image of the contaminated seed versus the control seed. And then this one shows a germinated sprout uh, that had the bioluminescent salmonella. And this one shows an image of the plant. And what you see in the root, if you look at carefully, you'll be seeing some yellow uh, coloration which shows the presence of salmonella. And this is again, you know, bioluminescent image. So now coming to the results, and uh, this one shows the results for uh, the presence of salmonella when contaminated seed was the route of exposure. In the y-axis, you see survivors in log CFU per mil or gram. And on the x-axis, you see the various samples. And uh, you can see the various uh, uh, four cultivars. The red bar shows uh, the results for space. The blue shows for Emilia. The green one shows Waitiki. And the purple one shows the Lazio. And as you can see in here with the seeds, not a, a big difference between the cultivars, of course. Vitiki as well as Lazio had slightly higher population of salmonella, but we had anywhere between seven to eight logs salmonella. And uh, the germinated sprout, no, no difference at all. All of them had about eight logs. And coming to the leaf, we had Vitiki showed the highest numbers, followed by Emilia, and then we had the other two cultivars. Uh, with the stem, I think uh, the number, the population was slightly lower than that in the leaf, but a similar kind of phenomenon here to where we Vitiki showed uh, uh, higher numbers compared to the other cultivars. And then coming to the root, root had the highest population among the all the plant parts, and uh, Emilia showed uh, slightly higher numbers compa compared to the other uh, types of cultivars. And with the soil, we had close to about three logs of salmonella, which means you can see that you know with any of these routes of exposure, the soil can easily get contaminated. And uh, among the four cultivars, not a big difference. Now coming to the water runoff, we were able to recover small uh, populations of salmonella, specifically on the Lazio, we had uh, about a log while the others did not show so much. And uh, this one shows a confocal image of uh, the spinach uh, hypocotyl, which is the stem portion. And uh, this was done like seven days after germination. And you can see the salmonella contained in the green fluorescent pro pro protein right there. And some of this is sub surface, while some, you know, some of it may be subsurface as well. Now looking at the other route of exposure, which is contaminated water, the results were slightly different in this case. And again, um, with the contaminated water, um, we had about 10 to the 7 in the uh, water itself. And uh, when the sprouts germinated, there was a little bit amount of growth. So we saw an increased one log, about eight logs, on all the cultivars. So it is possible that they were able to utilize the nutrients, and they were able to grow in the germinated sprout. And uh, with the leaf, uh, in case of you know leaf, stem, root, soil, as well as runoff, in all these cases, compared to the previous slide, you definitely see higher, higher population or slightly larger population of salmonella. And again, with the leaf, we had up to more than four logs, and uh, Vitiki and Lazio had slightly higher numbers compared to the other, other two cultivars. Stem, not a big difference. Um, among the four cultivars. With the root, again, you know, um, uh, comparable to the leaf, slightly more than four logs uh, in the root. And uh, with both soil as well as water runoff, in this route of exposure, we saw higher population. Again, with the Waitiki as well as Emilia, higher populations uh, compared to, Lazy, uh, 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 to space as well as uh, Lazio. And similar was the case with the water runoff. And again, this one shows the confocal imaging. And uh, you can see more number of cells in this case. Uh, again, this was done like seven days after uh, germination. And uh, now coming to internalization, we saw totally different results. 
So uh, coming to you know some, I'm doing in the summary I'm going to talk to you about internalization. So when contaminated water was the route of exposure, these this was the population of salmonella present in the various plant parts. And uh, looking at internalization, we were able to see internalization in the sprouts of Waitiki as well as in Emilia. However, when we came to the four leaf stage plant, we did not see any internalization at all with the uh, contaminated water out of exposure. Now coming to the contaminated seed as the route of exposure, varying populations of salmonella, you know, with the sprout having the highest population followed by the root and then leaf and then the stem. And uh, coming to the germinated sprouts, we did not see any internalization at all in any of the cultivars in any samples. However, in the four leaf stage, we were able to see contamination or internalization in the uh, leaves of all the, all the four cultivars. Leaves had salmonella after, en and again, all this was after enrichment. And then in the stem of uh, Lazio, uh, Emilia, as well as space, and also roots of these three cultivars, we were able to see internalization. So from the results, we were able to conclude that you know, both these routes, you're going to see some internalization. However, if your seed is contaminated to begin with, then it is possible that salmonella would be able to persist in the crop. And uh, another conclusion from the study is that, you know, the mechanism of internalization based on these two routes of exposure probably is different. And also the depth that the organism is able to internalize is definitely going to be different. With water, what we think is it's superficial. And uh, what, what could have happened, we think, is that in the sprout, uh, we were able to see some amount of internalization. And then in the plant, we did not see any internalization. So what we are thinking is that the surface sterilization was probably too harsh for the organisms to survive, even though they, you know, they might have been somewhat in the subsurface. And those that survived probably were injured, and they were not able to survive through the four-leaf stage. And in case of um, the contaminated seed, it is possible that again with, you know, with the surface sterilization, nothing survived on the sprout. However, they were probably deep inside the tissue and we were able to see internalization in the four leaf stage. So uh, bottom line, if your seed stock is contaminated, then you have a chance of you know, having salmonella per persist in the crop and so on. So that's on this particular project. Now I'm going to move on to the uh, attachment as well as possibility of cross-contamination from harvesting equipment. And here we focused on coring tool. So coring tool is a little device that looks like this. And what they do is this knife part is used to cut the lettuce from the ground. And this is the coring region. This coring region, what they do is they would cut the lettuce, they would remove all the outer leaves, and they would core this hard portion. And uh, this they basically do on the iceberg lettuce that is going for fresh cut produce as salads. Okay, And the reason they want to remove this hard part is during shredding or chopping, it's going to be really difficult to cut this portion. So they remove it off, and then they would, what they do is in the, in the field, once they cut the plant, they would core the lettuce one after another like this. They just remove the core, and then it, a, a small amount of sanitizer is sprayed on the core region, and then this is packaged, it goes in the processing plant, and then it is shred and packaged, you know, shred, sanitized, and then packaged, and so on. So what we wanted to do in this particular project is we wanted to see if, what is the possibility of cross-contamination of salmonella or E. coli from the coring tool into the iceberg lettuce. And the reason we wanted to see this is, you know, in the, in the field, the workers, what they would do is they would cut these lettuce one after another. They would work constantly for two hours. So they would pick up this, uh, a tool from the bucket containing the sanitizer. They would bring it and they would, you know, keep cutting, keep cutting, coring, cut, core, cut core, so they would be coring several hundreds of lettuce heads. And after two hours, they would take a break. So at that time, what they would do is they would take, take the uh, tool, they would put it into a bucket of sanitizer. Then they'll come back and they would be coring several lettuce heads as well. So uh, what, can, what, what we wanted to see is, let's say there's a contamination in the field itself. 
let's say, you know, one or two lettuce, lettuce heads are contaminated. What is the potential for this contamination to be passed on to the subsequent lettuce heads? So in this particular project, we called about 100 lettuce heads consecutively, one after another without a break, and then, then we sampled uh, the coring tool, the coring region, and then what we did was we sampled this particular region that the coring tool had touched. Okay, and in this particular project, we used several designs of coring tools. So what you're seeing here is the original design that has been used by growers for a long period of time. And in our project, we developed some modified designs. And the reason we developed modified designs is because if you look at this region, there is a welding. And uh, there is an assumption that in the welding region, salmonella can or any other uh, bacteria can attach well and the contamination can be passed on. So we came up with some modified designs, as you can see in here. And in the modified designs, we had like three different designs and three different lengths and combinations of each of these. And the design one, so this is the original design as I showed you before. And the design one basically has a shorter front and the coring knife, this region is pretty straight. And then in the design two, the front is very similar to the original design, but there's no welding. So there's no welding in any of these modified designs. And the front is pretty long. And in the design three, you have a very similar to design one, you have a short front, but the coring knife is slightly angled. And I think the reason they want to have it at an angle is because, you know, coring might be easier. So that's what, that's why they had. So our engineers came up with the different combinations of these uh, designs as well as lengths. For example, we had design one, length one, design one, length two, design one, length three, and so on and so forth. And, um, so in this uh, project, we evaluated the original design as well as several combinations of modified designs. We called about 100 different lettuce heads, and then we sampled the, uh, the, the coring knife as well as the cold region of the lettuce. And this is what we came up with. So in this particular slide, on the y-axis, you're seeing the person positive lettuce heads. And on the x-axis, you see the various uh, coring tool designs. And I'm not showing you all of them. I'm just showing uh, a few of them. And as you can see, with the original coring design, we had about 91% positive lettuce heads. So that had, you know, the highest uh, one. And then with our design three length one, we had about 70% positive uh, lettuce heads. And with the design one length two, we had about 65%. And the design two length two was our best one, where we had only 44% uh, positive lettuce heads. So this clearly showed that the modified designs were better at reducing the dissemination of cross contamination compared to the original design. So coming to the summary and conclusions from this part of the work, uh, the coring tool design modified coring tool designs would be probably better to use in the field conditions because they can reduce cross-contamination between lettuce heads. And uh, the design two length two, as we saw in the previous slide, had the lowest person positive lettuce heads followed by design one length two. And then the original design tool, and also I didn't show you the result of design three length three, but design three length three also had more than 90% positive lettuce heads. So these may not be the best one to apply in the field conditions. And uh, our conclusion was that if you modify the design, you can prevent cross-contamination, yes. Do you sanitize the coring? No, no sanitization at all. So what we do is we inoculate the coring region with the bacteria. And for this one, we basically used a non-pathogenic strain of E. coli K12 because it's a large-scale experiment. And we did not want to use salmonella. But the surrogate that we have has uh, very, very uh, similar characteristics to salmonella. So we were able to use that. So we did all the 100 heads one after another without any sanitization in between. Yeah. Any other questions? No? OK. So. That was on that particular project. Now we move on to the next one, which is looking at commercially available organic compost as well as compost amended soils. And we did this uh, study because many of the growers have been asking us in the organic application, which one would be you know best one to apply in the field conditions. So we, we, we evaluated uh, about 13 different uh, commercial organic composts. And uh, among this, uh, I think some of them, uh, most 
most of them are commercial, and we also had some that the growers are making in their own field. So we, we wanted to evaluate the, those as well. And if you look at the composition of these, it's very varied. We have anyone, any, anywhere from green type of compost to poultry manure to steer, steer manure, dairy manure, horse manure, and so on and so forth. So we, what we did was we inoculated these different uh, compost and compost amended soils with the foodborne pathogenic bacteria. And these were incubated at room temperature for a certain period of time, depending on the survival. And then we took samples at uh, different uh, durations, and uh, these are the results. So the first table shows the survival of salmonella newport in uh, compost as well as compost fermented soils. And I'm giving you just a few example results in here. And we did the sampling up to day 14 because salmonella was able to survive in some of the compost until then. And uh, compost number 4 and 5 as well as 13, we were able to see that specifically in compost number 4, organisms survive only up to day 7 and 5 only up to day 3 and uh, no survivors uh, thereafter. Again, with compost number 13, the survival was only up to day 10. So they did not survive uh, very well in these uh, composts. And now coming to E. coli oven 5787, what we saw is uh, the survival was even lower. We had to go for hours and not even days because it did not survive. And in here, compost number 3, by 8 hours, we did not uh, detect any surviving E. coli and thereafter as well. And then with the other, you know, number, compost number 1, number 2, 4, and 5, by by three days or 72 hours, we did not see any survivors. And uh, so coming to, you know, the conclusions are, you know, summary from this part of the work, uh, and some of these recommendations we have given to the growers as well. What we found was the compost that had steer manure based, they were not, they did not support the survival of uh, foodborne pathogenic bacteria at all. And, uh, and those were compost number four and five. Those both, both those were steer manure based. And not only that, if the conditions were alkaline, for example, example, sample four and five had a pH of about nine. And we saw that alkaline conditions, the pathogens were not able to survive very well. And also moisture had a role to play in. So the water potential, wherever we had lower water potential, then the organisms did not survive. So the samples that were drier than the others had lower recovery of microorganisms. Samples 4, 5, 1, and 2 were much drier than the others, and they did not support the survival. And then we also enumerated the background microflora because we wanted to see if there was going to be any competition. So if the background microflora gave a competition where the foodborne pathogenic bacteria are not able to survive, and we did not see any kind of a correlation. For example, sample six had the highest population of the background microflora, microflora about 10 to the 9, but that did not have any effect on the pathogens at all. So, you know, not a big correlation there. And in general, E. coli survived uh, for a shorter duration compared to salmonella in all of these uh, 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 commercial composts as well as you know, compost amended soils. And to the growers, we recommended samples four and five for the field conditions because those were the ones that did not support the survival of foodborne pathogenic bacteria. And we have applied these in field conditions and we have done some field studies and we have got some promising results you know, uh, due to lack of time. I'm not able to show those results to you today. So that was on that project. Now we move on to the next one, which is dust. Is dust being, can be, can dust be a vehicle of salmonella as well as other pathogens? And the reason we did this project, as I told you before, is that in the desert region, we have a lot of dust storms, as you can see here. That's, uh, you know, we see these dirt devils, dust devils, all the time when we drive, you know, in Arizona. And these happen in the vicinity of the growing field conditions as well. And because our growers had a concern that they are getting positive hits, specifically after a dust storm and before a rainfall event, we wanted to see what is happening when we inoculate soil and dust with salmonella and we expose the uh, leafy greens to these, uh, what is the transfer and so on. So that's what we did in our project. And previous studies have shown that dust can disperse pathogens. For example, uh, uh, my postdoc, he did some work using tomatoes. So he created uh, arti artificial you know, salmonella contaminated dust 
which was uh, deposited onto tomato blossoms and salmonella was able to persist on tomato blossoms and when the fruit developed from these contaminated tomato blossoms we were, he was able to recover small numbers of salmonella from the internal parts of the fruit so it is uh, possible you know dust can be a vehicle so uh, for the methods, we used again salmonella for this particular study and we used both organic as well as conventional soil. So we got the soil from organic fields as well as conventional fields, produce lettuce, iceberg lettuce fields in Yuma, Arizona and uh, we inoculated those with the bioluminescent salmonella as you can see in here. And uh, uh, we took a lettuce leaf and we used a cork borer and we made small disks. So we got the disks of uh, iceberg lettuce and uh, we put them on top of the inoculated soil in a petri dish. Okay, so the petri dish was left open and the soil contains organic and conventional soil contains salmonella. We put these disks on top of the soil and we gave various exposure times, 5 seconds, 5 minutes as well as 1 hour. And then after that, we took these, you know, um, uh, lettuce disks and uh, we enumerated both the soil as well as the lettuce samples, you know, totaling about one gram. We took, you know, one gram weight of these lettuce disks and these went through uh, dilutions as well as plating and we enumerated them for salmonella. And then we also calculated the person transfer rate based on this formula, that is number of colonies on the destination, which is going to be your lettuce. Uh, divided by number of colonies on the source, which is the soil, plus the number of colonies on destination, destination which is the lettuce, times 100. So I'm going to show you uh, some of these results in here. So what you're seeing here is uh, the result for the conventional soil, and this shows the result for organic soil. And again, this is a biophotonic imaging using an EMCCD camera which shows the contamination of salmonella on the, contam uh, on the conventional as well as on organic soil. So coming to this particular table, this column shows the population of the salmonella in the soil to begin with. So at five seconds, we had about six and a half logs of salmonella. And in about five minutes, not a big reduction, but after one hour, the uh, population was less than three logs of salmonella. And what happened in this case is uh, the two, two types of soil are very different. The conventional soil is more of a sandy type of a soil, and by one hour, the soil ha had dried quite a bit. And if you look at the person transfer, with five seconds, we have about 3.8 logs. Uh, we had a 3.8 percent transfer and uh, with five minutes we had about 4.6 percent transfer and if you look at one hour we had a big jump 81.85 percent transfer and what we believe happened is because the soil was becoming drier and the lettuce was uh, probably still uh, you know was not as dry as the soil and because of maybe chemotaxis presence of moisture more organisms were able to transfer onto uh, the lettuce in conventional type of a soil now coming to the results of the organic soil yeah, if you look at uh, the initial population at all these three time points they are close to anywhere from eight to eight and a half lux and uh, this type of a soil, the organic soil, is very different from conventional soil. It is more of a clay type of a soil, loamy clay type of a soil, and it retains a lot of moisture. And by one hour, what we saw was that the soil did not dry at all. It was still the same. And uh, so if you look at the person transfer, venetal transfer, with five seconds, only 0.85%, uh, followed by one, one and a half percent transfer, and only two and a half percent transfer by about one hour. And that could be again because of the presence of moisture in the soil, not too many tra organisms transfer to the lettuce leaf. So depending on the type of cultivation, the contamination is going to be different. It's not going to be all the same as what we learned from this. And coming to dust, with the dust, we did not see a large amount of transfer, specifically under low humidity conditions. So when we did the experiment at room temperature with about, let's say, 10% relative humidity, the transfer was really, really low. And when we bumped up the humidity to up to 40%, we were able to see a lot of transfer from dust as well. And uh, so to summarize this part of the work, uh, again, the transfer of salmonella from the soil to the leaf will depend on the type of soil.
For example, if your soil is going to be drier, sandy type of soil, as we saw in the case of conventional soil, then it is possible that there would be a reduction in the bacterial population over time, and more organisms will be transferring onto the uh, produce crop. And if the soil is going to be moist, uh, if it can hold a lot of moisture, uh, such as in the case of organic soil, as well as compost cemented soil, we tested the compost cemented soil, and that one was kind of in between organic and conventional. I didn't show you the results today, but more similar to organic, then it, it did retain more bacteria over a period of time and less number of organisms transferred onto the leaf. And uh, so again, transfer was higher from conventional soil compared to the organic soil. And coming to the dust, the transfer rate was very, very low at room temperature and with about 10% humidity. We had 0.002% transfer with about you know, three logs of salmonella. And again, three logs can be a significant number. Uh, and uh, when we increase the relative humidity to 40% and again to 60%, we were able to see more organisms being transferred from dust. So the conclusion here is that if you're going to have a dust storm, and let's say it's going to be raining and the humidity is higher, then there is a possibility that if the dust carries salmonella, you can have a cross-contamination onto the produce crop. That is definitely a possibility. And, you know, we speculate that that could be one of the reasons that the growers were able to see salmonella after a dust storm uh, before a rainfall type of an event. And we are continuing, you know, more research in this area with more variables. So now we move on to the next project, which is uh, the melons uh, work that we did. And this is the work we did in collaboration with uh, Dr. Patel, Dr. Crosby, and uh, their team in here. And uh, uh, the reason we did this project is because uh, we had a few outbreaks, really serious outbreaks uh, of listeria as well as salmonella from cantaloupes in 2009, I, th I believe in 2010, 11 as well. And so um, we sampled specific genotypes that were uh, from the Texas A&M breeding program. Dr. Crosby uh, um, came up with these uh, genotypes and these 21 genotypes were sent to us uh, in Tucson and we looked at the natural prevalence of salmonella as well as listeria in these special genotypes. And uh, so when these uh, melons came into the lab, we looked at the size of these melons. So what we did was from the stem scar, we measured the longitudinal circumference, and then we took plugs from the stem scar from the bottom and from the sides, uh, including a little bit of the pulp, uh, accounting to about 10 gram. And then we sampled these for the pr presence of salmonella as well as listeria. So what we did was we took these plugs and uh, we did a uh, pre-enrichment followed by selective enrichment and this was followed by enumeration on selective plating media and if we had presumptive positives then we confirmed those using biochemical tests such as APA strips or immunological methods like latex agglutination test or molecular methods such as uh, PCR. So what did we find from this part of the work? We, we showed that the largest melon was this particular melon having a circumference of 62.23 centimeters. And the smallest melon was this one that had 46.57 uh, centimeter long longitudinal circumference. And uh, looking at uh, the pathogens, we did not find any of these 21 genotypes being positive for either salmonella or listeria monocytogenes. However, one of the cantaloupe from, I think, I believe, line 1405 was positive for listeria inocua. And listeria inocua is a non-pathogenic type of listeria, which is a very good surrogate organism for listeria monocytogenes. So the conclusion from this part of the work is that the good result is, you know, no pathogens. However, because we were able to find one of the surrogates uh, being, you know, uh, being present in there, it is possible that the conditions could be conducive for the survival of Listeria monocytogenes as well. Yes. Oh, 21 genotypes, and in each one we had like two or three uh, cantaloupes in each genotype. Yeah, yeah. So we, we had only one that was positive for Listeria inocua. So because we saw Listeria inocua, and if it can be present there, that means conditions could be favorable for the presence of Listeria monocytogenes as well. So it may be better to, you know, follow good agricultural practices and so on and so forth. 
So now we move on to the next part, which is post-harvest. Does anyone, uh, anyone have any questions before I move on to the next one? How about the panel of Brown? Were they sent to you as the melons, or did y'all uh, grow them in Yuma? Oh, no, they were sent from here. Okay. Yeah, they were sent from here in boxes. Yeah, yeah, they were not growing Yuma. Yeah, we have another project where we have sampled melons from Yuma, but I'm not showing those. And we are doing more studies on those. We are looking at the attachment strength, and then we are also looking at the efficacy of natural sanitizers on the skin of those melons. So we have, you know, we have been, you know, doing some uh, studies on in that regard as well. So now we move on to the post-harvest sanitization using natural antimicrobials as well as organic sanitizers. And, uh, you know, these uh, plant antimicrobials, they are a very good alternative to chemical sanitizers because they have very strong bactericidal activity. They are effective not only on foodborne pathogens, but they are also effective on spoilage microorganisms, which means the shelf life can be enhanced as well. And the current consumers want natural ingredients in their products so uh, more than likely these would be welcome or acceptable by the consumer and there are several advantages to using these natural sanitizers over chemical sanitizers such as chlorine because the efficacy of these antimicrobials is not affected in the presence of organic matter. With chlorine, the efficacy is affected. You have to dump more and more chlorine in order to sanitize produce. So that's, you know, uh, one advantage. The other advantage is they are energy efficient. They are effective at room as well as cold temperatures. And also they are environmentally friendly because these are plant, uh, plant products. They are, these are biodegradable as opposed to chemical type of sanitizers that can form carcinogenic compounds upon reacting, reacting with organic matter. And also one very important point to note about these natural compounds is they have residual activity during storage. They continue to act during storage. If you're going to store your produce after treatment for seven days, they continue to kill the bacteria, which means they are going to prevent or they can even kill any cross-contamination that can occur during transportation or during storage and so on. And uh, Apart from these benefits, uh, many of them can enhance the flavor. For example, um, oregano oil is uh, added as a flavoring to many of the salad dressings these days. So and they, they can you know, improve the flavor, and they also have their own health benefits. For example, they can reduce cholesterol, they can reduce blood sugar, and they, some of them even have anti-cancer type of an activity. So these are some of the advantages. And also, in our uh, lab, we have shown that these, uh, the wash water can containing these plant antimicrobials and organic sanitizers can be recycled. We have used the same wash water to wash five batches of leafy greens one after another, and we were able to see the same amount of kill. So they are pretty effective. They don't lose their efficacy, so recycling can be done. And this, these are considered you know, clean label technology. They are also generally recognized as safe by the FDA. So which means, you know, uh, these, these may be, you know, good to use in your sanitization uh, um, processes and so on. So I'm going to give you some example results of the type of work we have done. And this one shows the results of uh, washing celery. So we treated fresh cut celery in 1% uh, carvacrol, which is the active component present in oregano oil, and 1% cinnamaldehyde, which is the active component present in cinnamon oil. And we did the treatment for about 10 minutes, and the treated celery was then stored uh, for uh, up to three days at four degrees C, and uh, we saw if there was any inactivation. So the result in this table shows that the control, which was not treated, had about five logs of salmonella at day zero and uh, at day three we had about four and a half logs and with the one person carvacrol we were able to kill the bacteria completely and for this particular study we used an antibiotic resistant strain of salmonella newport which is resistant to at least six antibiotics that we know of and so this uh, was pretty effective with the cinnamaldehyde we had about a log reduction at day zero and the reduction increased to uh, two two logs by day three. And this one shows the results of uh, oregano oil treatment on iceberg lettuce. So in this case, we did 
two different temperatures, 4 degrees C as well as 8 degrees C. And the reason we did 8 degrees C, we consider this as an abuse temperature, which can happen during transportation and also in consumer homes. In consumer homes, most of the time, the fridge may not be at 4 degrees C. It may be, you know, 6 or 8 degrees C. Yes. Yes, we use it. It's a proprietary blend. That's why I'm not talking to you about it. Yeah, again, that, the, the emulsifier is also a plant-based ingredient. And uh, all you need to do is you need to add the ingredient. And with a lot of sheer force, you can, in, you can create a pretty you know, fine microemulsion. Yeah, yeah. So four degrees C and eight degrees C, and we did uh, two different uh, times of exposure: one minute as well as uh, two minute treatment. Okay, and uh, we did three different concentrations of the oregano oil: 0.1 percent, 0.3 percent, as well as a 0.5 percent. And what you're seeing on the y-axis is the survivors and log CFU, and uh, on the x-axis you are seeing the days of storage. And as you can see in all these four graphs, with 0.5 percent, we were able to inactivate salmonella even immediately upon exposure. And even with a 0.3%, beginning at day one, we did not see any survivors. And with a 1%, again, compared to the control, our control was uh, washed in phosphate buffered saline because that's one of the solutions we use to dispense our antimicrobials as well, in addition to the emulsifier. And, uh, and compared to the control with a 0.1%, we did see you know, a, a, a log to a log and a half and so on. So these results clearly show that even at 0.3%, we will be able to inactivate salmonella on the surface of um, organic iceberg lettuce. And uh, this slide shows a confocal imaging of a treatment of salmonella, the GFP containing salmonella we did with uh, uh, oregano oil. We used 0.5% oregano oil. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, before the bacterial population, you can see the GFP containing salmonella before treatment. And specifically, if you look at this particular region, you have the stomata. And you can see a lot of these organisms kind of trying to clutter around this particular stomatal region. And after the treatment, you can clearly see that most of these organisms were inactivated. We just see, you know, a couple of the cells only with the oregano oil treatment in there. And uh, this shows an example result using an organic sanitizer called the Chico Wash. And uh, this is, again, a proprietary formulation provided to us by one of the organic uh, sanitizer manufacturers. It is a citric acid-based uh, blend of a sanitizer. And we used uh, one minute as, a, as well as a two-minute treatment. And we did four different types of organic leafy greens, romaine lettuce, iceberg lettuce, baby spinach, as well as mature spinach. And we saw pretty good activity activity by, by three days. We stored the leafy greens at four degrees C for three days. And uh, again, with this particular slide, we are able to see pretty good activity. And as you can see in here, I'm not sure this thing is not working. But if you look at between day one, day zero, day one, and day three, we were able to see an increase in antimicrobial activity, which clearly shows that there is residual activity during storage in this, in this particular case. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not working. So to summarize from this particular, this part, this part of the work, we were able to show that plant antimicrobials had a storage time as well as a concentration dependent activity. And I did not show you the results for many of the plant extracts. And uh, with the olive extract, we were able to see up to three logs of reduction. With the hibiscus, we, we were able to see one log reduction. And hydrogen peroxide was one of our controls, because hydrogen peroxide is uh, approved for organic use. And because we were doing all these organic leafy greens, we used hydrogen peroxide as our control. And the activity of all our plant extracts was much better when compared to hydrogen peroxide. With hydrogen peroxide, again, it was a one-time kill. Like day zero, we would be able to see like one to one and a half logs reduction. With 
with these plant with the ex extracts as well as essential oils and uh, organic sanitizers it was a residual activity and we were able to see pretty uh, good activity during the storage period and we also did some studies with the background microflora because we wanted to see if these will be able to kill background microflora and uh, just with water wash while you know you are able to get two nox reduction with washing uh, with water containing these plant antimicrobials we were able to show up to a three logs reduction and uh, the reduction for olive extract was comparable to that of the hydrogen peroxide. It was very difficult to inactivate the background compared to the pathogen, but uh, these uh, compounds fired really well. And with Chico wash, we got about three logs reduction. And then uh, because the essential oils can be pungent and they may affect the sensory properties of the treated food, we went to the next step, which is doing a combination type of a treatment. So what we did was we combined an essential oil with a plant extract both at lower concentrations. So we use the essential oil at 0.1% and with 0.1% if you remember in the previous slides we got about you know one to one and a half to two logs reduction possibly and we combined that with a three percent plant extract and we were able to achieve more than four logs reduction in, con in the cases of uh, combination treatments and we are doing more research with combination treatment and, in, and it looks like the sensory properties we will be able to manage better with combination type of treatments uh, than the individual higher concentrations of essential oil or the uh, plant extract. And then we have also done a lot of studies using recycling five different batches of leafy greens one after another and these plant compounds have been able to maintain their effectiveness. We are able to achieve three to four log reductions easily and we are able to see the activity. And as you can see in these pictures, this, and this is the tank that we are treating uh, the leafy greens with, um, as you can see in these pictures down there. Now we move on to the final project, which is edible films. So edible films are usually made from plant puree. So if you have a flower or a vegetable or a fruit, as long as you can get a puree, you can add the antimicrobial into the puree and you add pectin, it is heated up and this goes through an equipment and you can cast this into a thin film. So these are called as antimicrobial edible films. And what you're seeing in this picture is films made of apple containing carbacrol as well as cinnamaldehyde. And what we do is we add these films into the salad bags and uh, these salad bags obviously we contaminate the leafy greens with salmonella and we store them at 4 degrees C and we see if we are able to inactivate the salmonella and uh, we have gotten some promising results. And there are certain advantages to using edible films. And edible films can be used on any food product. For example, if you have a piece of chicken, you can wrap the chicken with these antimicrobial edible films. And the advantages would be that you can prevent the loss of moisture from your food product. You can prevent cross-contamination because you're covering and you can reduce the microbial load. You can prevent cross-contamination. You can also prevent any browning. Browning, uh, if you've heard of Mylar reaction, you know, that can happen in some of the food products. So you can prevent that. So there are several advantages to using edible films. And uh, this particular slide shows uh, the results for apple film as well as carrot film. And uh, in here, we use two different concentrations of carvacrol as well as two different concentrations of cinnamaldehyde. And uh, we stored uh, the bag, the iceberg lettuce, for seven days at four degrees C. And if you look at uh, the three percent carvacrol, even at day zero, immediately upon exposure, we were able to get complete inactivation and that remained throughout the seven days of storage. <coughs> And with the one and a half percent carbacrol, only one and a half log survivors in this case. And with cinnamaldehyde, we got a pretty, you know, good reductions, uh, about a three log, and uh, you know, with one and a half percent cinnamaldehyde, slightly uh, lower reduction. And similar was the case with the carrot film as well. And then finally, hibiscus film. So we had hibiscus flowers. So with hibiscus flowers, we created a puree and we made hibiscus films. And the results for hibiscus were even better than carvacrol as well as cinnamaldehyde. Wherein you can see that 
um, with 3% carboxyl by day uh, 0, up to day 7, no survivors, and uh, also with 3% cinnamaldehyde, by day 7, no survivors as well, and very few survivors with 1.5% carboxyl as well as cinnamaldehyde. So summary from this part of the work, the antimicrobial edible films are very effective either as wrappings on meat products or as ingredients in salad bags. And in general, carbocrol films were better in inactivating bacteria compared to the cinnamaldehyde films. And we clearly saw that these also had a storage time dependent activity. If you looked at those slides, by seven day, we had more inactivation compared to day zero as well as day three. And uh, uh, comparing in between meats as well as leafy greens, obviously, you know, meat is a more complex matrix with fats and proteins and so on that can interfere with the antimicrobial activity. We had uh, better results with leafy greens, but on meats as well, we had at least three logs reduction of salmonella listeria as well as E. coli 015787. And the conclusion is that these can potentially be used to wrap meat products or as ingredients in salad bags. <coughs> So that's all I have. And before I uh, finish, I would like to uh, thank my lab group, my lab manager, Libin Zhu, and my postdoc, Dr. Dev Kumar, all my past as well as current graduate students. There's a big list there. And all my undergraduate students and also my lab group in Yuma that have been you know, doing some of the coring tool studies uh, and so on. I, without them, I would not have been able to present all this work to you today. So I would definitely like to thank them. I would like to thank all my collaborators. As you can see, the list in here from uh, various universities, including Dr. Patel, and other universities as well as USDA labs. And uh, last but not the least, I would like to thank the funding agencies, USDA, Arizona Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, Department of Ag uh, uh, in Arizona, uh, Arizona Iceberg Lettuce Research Council, and uh, International Life Sciences Institute for funding all this work. And thank you all for patiently listening. I know it's a long one, so I'll be happy to take any questions now. <laughs>